On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, it's the 2022 premiere of What The Ship Is Going On, the top five stories in maritime news. I am your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, our first for 2022. I am optimistic and hopeful for a new year. We have started this YouTube channel back in 2021. We followed a lot of news stories. We've had a lot of issues with 2021, but I am confident that 2022 is going to be a new year. I know that people in the maritime sector, industry, companies, ports, and government agencies, they have all learned their lessons from 2021. And going forward, we're going to have nothing but optimism and rosy pictures as we cover the top five news stories for the first week of 2022. So let's jump in to story number one. Story number one comes from G Captain Mike Schiller. Port of Los Angeles announces dwell fees for empty export containers. The Port of Los Angeles has announced plans to begin charging ocean carriers a dwell fee for empty containers lingering in marine terminals to combat congestion, adding pressure for carriers to pick up empties for transport back to Asia. The fee will be similar to import container dwell fees announced in late October, which has yet to be implemented. What the Foxtrot, Port of LA? Seriously, we're, we're doing this again. Now it's something new. So now the Port of LA has announced dwell fees, not for import containers, but for empty export containers. I mean, we can't even have a nice new year. We can't even have a new year where we, we can get off to a positive start. Instead, we're going to have this. LA is announcing this, which is going to be implemented on January 30th. It, it's basically the same thing that they're doing with the import containers, except now they're doing it with the exports. This is the news release from the Port of LA, which talks about it. Uh, under the policy starting January 30th, carriers will be charged $100 for an empty cont container dwelling for nine days, increasing $100 increments per container per day under container leaves the terminal. Quote, while we have seen significant success reducing import containers, on our docks the past two months. Too many empty containers are currently sitting on the marine terminals. Now, just to recap what has gone on with the other dwell fee, that dwell fee has been postponed eight times. It's Monday, <laughs> December 3rd, which means it's container dwell time postponement. Uh, we're expecting an announcement from the Port of LA to announce that the container import dwell fee will be postponed for the ninth time. And if you don't believe me, here are the dates right here, all listed out in this Daily Breeze story, which has them all right here for the amount of days it's being done. It was supposed to be implemented on November 1st. It was delayed, delayed again on November 15th, the 22nd, the 29th, December 6th, December 13th, and December 20th, and December 27th. And I'm gonna go out on a limb and say January 3rd. All right, I did an entire video about empty containers in the port of LA. Now let's just real quick look at something right here. Let's look at the data coming out from the port of LA. But just notice the change in difference between 2020 and 2021. Loaded imports down 13%. Loaded ex exports down almost 37%. Total loaded containers, either import exports down 18%. Total empty containers up, up 10.6%. The only thing that's increasing right now in the Port of LA is the amount of empty containers leaving. If you go to 2021 and you look at their year to date, the loaded exports, the total number of loaded exports is 1.1 million containers. The total number of empty exports is 3.6 million empty containers. I could have got my big Lego blocks, but basically for every one loaded export, there are three empty exports leaving. And again, if you look at this chart and you look from January to June, you see that LA was way over their numbers. They, they massively increased. We're going to get a story here fairly soon from the Port of LA that this is the best year in their history, which is true. But it was in the first six months where they made that. Now, they did great in this last six months, but one of the things you see here is a reduction in October and November down 8 and 8.8%. 8 and a lot of that 
has to do with the fact that their total imports fell. If you look at their total imports, their numbers were declining. They have been declining since August. And really the peak month where they brought in the most imports was back in May. If you go to the 2020 dates and you look at loaded exports versus loaded uh, empty exports, you'll see it's one to two. There's one loaded export for every two empty exports. If you go to the Port of LA's data for December 31st, this is their Port of LA operations report, very bottom thing here, empty containers on the Port of Los Angeles terminal and off dock depots as of 0800 December 31st, 2021, unavailable. We don't know how many empty containers there are. Now for the past month, they have been running in smaller vessels. One of the reasons why the number of containers is down in October, November, according to the executive director, Gene Soroka, is because they're bringing in smaller ships. Why are they bringing in smaller ships? Because they're bringing sweeper vessels in. Smaller sweeper vessels are coming in to get these containers out. And they are just overrun with empty containers. Here's the import containers by dwell time. This number should be substantially better. It's down 49% since October. It's down. The blue line shows you all those import containers that are down and they are clearing out the port. And one of the reasons why they've been able to clear out the port over the last couple of months, November and into December, is if you look at the signal report, here's their signal report, and you go down here to the weekly reports, you'll see the orange line there. That's last year's. The blue line is this year's. And you'll see week 47, that was the week of Thanksgiving. They were way down. Week 51, just before, prior to Christmas and, and New Year's, they were way down. And again, it's not the holiday because you can see where the orange line was last year. The reason they're down is they've been trying to sweep out those empty containers and clear them out. Why are we doing this? Why are you issuing this? This is just, and, and, and by the way, it's not going to be implemented until January 30th. So th this is, you've been sweeping out empty containers like crazy. This is meant again as a PR stunt to sit there and say, listen, we, we put this dwell fee hyper demurrage on this. There's hyper demurrage on imports. Now there's hyper demurrage on empty export containers. This is all just to show by the end of the month, hey, we don't have to implement this dwell fee because we've cleared everything out. Flexport just announced in a news release that they charted three 747s, three 747s to fly potatoes, potatoes from North America to Japan because the McDonald's in Japan were sh running short on potatoes for French fries. Yet we're shipping out maximum amount of empty containers than ever before. Yet we can't load a dozen containers full of potatoes and ship them to Japan. You got to charter three 747s to load with potatoes and fly them across. I No telling how much that cost, the amount of pollution caused by three you know, Pratt and Whitney turbo fans going on 747s across. And, and that is story number one. I was so hoping that things were going to be different, but fingers crossed. Let's go to story number two. Story number two comes from Eric Kulsich over at Freight Waves. The Federal Maritime Commission encourages shippers to file complaints against ocean carriers. The FMC on Tuesday updates policies to make it easier for cargo owners to file complaints against ocean carriers over alleged unfair and unreasonable business practices that result in financial or operational harm. The new guidelines clarify that trade associations and shipping cooperatives can bring action to protect individual companies from potential retaliation. Hello, FMC? Yeah, hi. This is Sal from What's Going On With Shipping. Oh, really? You watch. Do you enjoy it? Well, OK. Anyway, I'd like to report uh, some FMC violations about demurrage and detention charges on the Port of L.A. Yes, the Port of L.A. No, there's a new one. Yes, I, I, I know they do a hyper demurrage. Yeah, yes, yes, I know. It's been delayed. No, no, eight times. Probably nine today. But there's a new one. Yeah, this one's on empty containers. So can I go ahead and, and make this... Uh, charge can i hello hello hung up on it all right so 
FMC is now asking people, please, please come make allegations against shipping companies. Because for some strange reason, unknown to everybody, shippers who are dependent on a handful of small companies or large companies, actually, an oligarchy of nine companies in three massive alliances don't want to file suits against these sh big sh shipping lines for fear that the carriers will retaliate against them. And so now the FMC has basically opened the doors for anybody to make these allegations on behalf of shippers using the ocean carriers. We also see in this story, Juan High Lines comes under Federal Maritime Commission microscope for computer uh, for container detention. So right here, we're having a allegation uh, levied against the FMC, which is initiating an investigation on Juan High. Now, Juan High is not in those big alliances. As a matter of fact, they're the tenth largest container company out there, the third largest out of Taiwan. I think it's significant that the FMC is, is looking at one high in this way, since they're not one of the big ones in the, F, in, in the container alliance system. I got a little pushback on that from someone from the Journal of Commerce saying, well, wait a minute, ONE, HOPHOG, MSC have been under investigation, which I think is true, but I will also note that where are those investigations going to basically go? one of the predicates for the passage of the Ocean Reform Act that just went through the House of Representatives. It was passed under the co-sponsorship of Representatives Garamendi and Johnson from California and South Dakota, bipartisan, huge amount of support behind it. Obviously, groups like the World Shipping Council oppose this because, again, we saw in testimony before the U.S. Congress that the head of the World Shipping Council, uh, John Butler, basically use the, the allegation that they are forced to bring export containers out of the United States in lieu of empties, that's going to impact the ability to bring in imports, which is true. But understand the empties right now that are being cleared out of LA in record number, again, three empties, every one loaded container, are heading to Asia to be loaded with more goods to come back quicker. And that continues to tip the scale in how fast Asia can export goods to how fast we can import goods. And that's one of the big issues we see. The Federal Maritime Commission under fact finding number 29, Rebecca Dye, one of the commissioners, five commissioners, has been investigating this issue of detention, demerge and charges by these container liners since March, not March, 2021, March, 2020, uh, against the ocean carriers. While at the same time, Port of LA and Long Beach have imposed this hyper demurrage on import containers. And now the Port of LA is prepared to fine for empty containers heading out. Not by what, just empty containers, not the export containers, just the empty containers going out. That's what they're getting ready to fine. And, and again, it, it's, it's the government sending these mixed signals. On one hand, the FMC is investigating this. On the other hand, John Picari, the port envoy working with the ports, is encouraging these elements. And man, I, again, two stories in a row, I was hoping we would see some changes. But here's, fingers crossed, for story number three. Story number three comes from G-Captain. It's a Reuters story. The CDC, the Center for Disease Control, says everyone, even fully vaccinated, should avoid cruise ships. The U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention said people should avoid traveling on cruise ships regardless of the vaccination status as daily COVID-19 cases in the country climb to record highs due to the fast-spreading Omicron variant. The move delivers another blow to the cruise ship industry that just started returning to the seas in June after a months-long suspension of voyages caused by the pandemic. Okay. If you remember way back in 2020, where did COVID really enter everyone's attention? The cruise ship industry. It was the cruise ship industry. What did the cruise ship industry do? They had breakouts on board, particularly Princess Cruise Lines, the Ruby Princess, a few other ones had it. And, and one of the things that the cruise ship industry did, obviously, was stop sailing, put their ships at anchorages off Florida, in the Bahamas, off Singapore and these big anchors around. 
And they kept their crews on board and they kept thinking that this is going to be a short term element, maybe a few months and then get back into the cruise industry. And they didn't. Instead, they wound up with ships floating around with crews fully on board, sitting there burning money. And eventually they had to do a massive cross-decking operation and literally sail vessels back to home ports of the crews. Uh, they loaded you know, all the crews from the Philippines and sailed back to the Philippines. Same thing for India, same thing for Bangladesh, you name it. Uh, it cost them billions of dollars. The cruise ship industry has been bleeding money left and right. If you look at the stocks of the three major cruise lines, Carnival, Royal Caribbean, and Norwegian, they're only about halfway back to where they were pre-COVID. And they had just started running back at capacity, uh, implementing safety checks, vaccination statuses, big fight in Florida, for example, about whether or not they can uh, test for vaccine on board. And so it created this whole backdrop here of an industry with, with, with a, a lot of issues at play. Go to these stories right now, and there's a slew of them on G Captain. Uh, this story right here just came out. Brazil Health Agency warns against cruise ship travel. This one right here. Passengers disembark COVID hit cruise ship after five days stuck in Lisbon. This story, COVID outbreak ends voyage for thousands aboard the cruise ship. Putting thousands of people back on board cruise ships is a recipe, especially with the Omicron variant, which is a very virulent version of COVID. It spreads, even if everybody's negative, everybody's tested, everybody's vaccinated. All you have to do is expose these people once to somebody ashore, someone somewhere, or someone has it, test negative because it just hasn't materialized yet. And it's going to spread like crazy. The cruise industry, in my opinion, again, this is my opinion, should have, if they were gonna embark on this, go out with reduced crews, reduced numbers on board. When you're packed on board in very tight environments with air circulating and in and, and enclosed areas, you're going to get positive hits. Now. I think we have to live with the fact, too, that COVID is going to be around for a long time. It's going to be like the flu. People catch, we know, on, on cruise ships, disease all the time. There was the norovirus. We've seen this time and time again. But the cruise ship industry is not really helping themselves. On top of that, the CDC has now come out with this, your cruise ship color status. That's right, folks. If you're thinking about going on a cruise ship, you should check the color status of your cruise ship. You can scroll down here and find your different cruise ships. That's right, they have these different color warnings on board. Green, no reported cases. Orange, reported cases below the threshold. Yellow, uh, reported cases for COVID have met the threshold. Or red, reported cases are at or above the threshold for the CDC. This is something that CLIA, the Cruise Line International Association, and the cruise ship agencies do not want you to know about. But here it is, and you can you know, look at cruise lines, see which ones are which level. You can see right here the different vessels. So for example, Carnival Ecstasy is at an orange, Carnival Horizon is at green, and you can go down this list, and what they're doing is tracking all these cruise ships to see what level they're at right now, so that before you embark, you can have an idea of the reported conditions, because it does get confusing on the number, you'll notice there are no reds out there. Orange is the highest level that we see right now. The Norwegian Cruise Lines, the Pride of America, which operates around Hawaii, is at an orange level right there. Most of these are at yellow or green right now, but you can scroll through and I'll include this in uh, the show notes, Carnival Paradise. But the CDC is tracking this. And again, this is tough for all aspects of the industry. It just happens that Omicron is, is definitely one of these virulent forms of COVID. It, it just, it spreads. But a lot of people who are vaccinated and get it do not get deathly sick. Uh, there are, you know, issues with it. You remember what the vaccine does doesn't prevent you from getting it. It just prevents you largely from dying from it or getting a severe case of COVID. So cruise ship industry, which started this all back with the beginning of COVID, is, is experiencing it again. So, all right, well, we're over three so far. Let's go to story number four. Story number four comes from Splash 24-7, Sam Chambers. Ningbo struggles with another 
COVID-19 outbreak. The city of Ningbo, uh, Ningbo, sorry, home to the world's largest port, reported 10 COVID-19 cases over the weekend at a clothing factory, sparking increased testing of workers across much of the city, adding to delays among truck workers heading to the metropolis's busy container terminals. Parts of the district of Beilin, where the clothing factory is based, have gone into lockdown. Beilin is also where some of the city's busiest container terminals are located. Add to that a Lloyd's List story by Chichin Shen, Yangtze River pilot lockdown intensifies China's port congestion. Vessels are being stranded at ports on the river due to lack of pilots and the lineup of vessels forced to wait in the anchorages outside the estuary is increasing rapidly. At least 200 pilots at Nanjing and Jiaying stations have been quarantined by Chinese officials or after two tested positive for coronavirus earlier this week. COVID in China, shutdown of ports, pilots not being able to move vessels. Uh, I, I, I thought I thought we had an agreement in 2022. I, I, I thought we we're going to start fresh. I, I thought we were going to get positivity in here. And yet we're right back to where we started from, seeing a shutdown in the ports. Uh, we reported last year, at the end of the year, that the Pearl River was having issues with feeder vessels, that the vessels that feed into the large container vessels at the major terminals had slowed down. What this means for us is that exports out of China are going to slow down. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, wait a minute, Sal, that's great. The ports in the United States can catch up. However, there has to be weekly sailings of vessels. There has to be routine sailings because what's gonna happen is what happened in the spring in summer of 2020, when all of a sudden China stopped moving as many goods, a tsunami of ships came across backloading vessels to get back across and overwhelmed our ports again into the early 2021. And we're seeing kind of the same lineup as we did in 2020 happening here. So I was hoping for positivity in our fourth story, but I don't see it happening. So, all right, we're 0 for 4. Let's knock on wood. All right, so story number five is my prospects for 2022. Now, based on the first four stories, you would think the prospects aren't that good. But I, I would actually differ with that. Uh, I just did a video with John Conrad and I where we looked at the top five maritime stories from 2021. But John and I both looked at the top five stories. Uh, we had a kind of a dueling top five stories there. But our prospects for 2022, we didn't really get a chance to go into a lot of detail about it. So I wanted to take a minute and, and, and talk about it. So one of the things I think that actually is going to happen is number one, the, the virus COVID-19 will run its course. As a historian, I teach a course in world civilization. And I usually focus on three topics. And the last topic I've focused on over the past two years has been pandemics, global pandemics. And in particular, we've looked at the Spanish flu of 1918 to 1920. That virus lasted for three years. It takes about three years to run its course. And I actually had thought about the fact that that's what it's going to take for this one to run its course. Even with the vaccines, even with everything else, it's going to take three years. And so 2022, we'll see us start coming out of this on the backside. World trade is down. Uh, if you look at the review of maritime transport for 2021, world trade had de decreased because of the fact of COVID. We're having slowdowns in ports, even though LA and Long Beach are at record levels, other ports are at record levels. Prior to that, we had a slowdown in 2021. 20, uh, 2020 was a slowdown. 2021, we may see an uptick and we probably will see an uptick. Uh, we see that we're still interrelated in our trade and commerce around the world. More goods are being moved around the world's oceans than ever before. But one of the prospects I want to put out there for you is this. Number one, I don't think freight rates are going to go back down to pre-COVID levels ever right now, unless there's a huge, massive recession, which I don't see foresee happening. Uh, I think we're going to stay at freight rates being pretty high, which means that for most goods, it's going to be more expensive to buy it, inflation. 
It's just the fact. Some goods are going to be cost prohibitive to ship anymore, large bulk items, which may mean that some manufacturing comes back into the United States and hopefully there's going to be labs and areas where funding can be available to get those startups going. That'd be great to see. Uh, I am not one who thinks that we can put the walls up and just be self-sufficient on our own. We're not. We, we're not self-sufficient in almost any category, neither is most of the world. You know, read um, uh, Mark Levinson's newest book on globalization. You'll realize how interrelated we really are. We require free seas to be able to move goods. And I think we're going to keep being dependent on ocean traffic. I think the infrastructure bill that recently passed, the $2.25 billion being put into port infrastructure is great, but I don't think it's going to be managed very well because the mechanisms aren't in place to do it. I think it's going to be a fight among the ports to get their piece of the pie. They're going to basically scrap and, and fight for every dollar they can get. And we're basically doing that. We're pitting them against each other. Which you can argue that's free market, that's capitalism. But again, the ocean carriers are not free market capitalism. They're oligarchies in three massive alliances. They can put the ports, they compete the ports against each other. Look at Boston. Boston just invested in dredging the port, putting in four brand new gantry cranes, and their container input is down tremendously. Tremendously. And this is what the ocean carriers are going to do. They're going to bypass Boston because they're being delayed in Savannah, New York, New Jersey. If you look at the ports in New Year's, and I did, I looked at all the ports. I went from Seattle, Tacoma, all the way around the United States, and you're seeing lines of vessels off the ports right now. Now, that's natural holiday season. Things slow down. You start to see ships accumulate. But this is a factor that's not just LA and Long Beach. It's Savannah. It's New York, New Jersey. It's not as pronounced on the East and Gulf Coast because of the number of ports. It's more pronounced on the West Coast, also because a lot of our goods come from Asia, and therefore there's more volume coming from Asia across. This is a national security issue, making sure our ports and imports are efficient. We need national level attention to this. Uh, one of the best things I think that came out of 2021 was the exposure of supply chain to the public. 32,000 of you found my YouTube channel, 2.6 million views of videos, which is not because of me in this face. Come on, let's be serious here. This, this is not going to attract anybody to watch, but it's because you have a desire to learn about this sector, this, this area. I am not an expert in road, rail, aviation. I do shipping. I don't do all of shipping. Someone highlighted the fact that I'd, I've never worked for a container company. Well, that's true. I also were never an ancient Roman, yet I teach Roman history. I, I can learn. I can educate myself. I can figure things out. And by the way, if we only let people within their own fields teach, it would take dozens of people to bring this YouTube channel to you. I tap into that expertise. I know people in all the fields. And, and that's one of the things I like to do is talk to them and get their perspective and relate it to you. Do I tell you everything is 100% perfect? And do I never get anything wrong? No, no, no. Talk to my wife. She'll tell you how imperfect I am. But one of the things I do think is raising the attention level is really important. And one of the things I'd like to see is more focus on this. Uh, we see Gene Soroka from the Port of LA come out and talk about the Port of LA. What we need to see are the big shipping lines. We need to see the terminal operators. These are the people. We don't need John Butler from the World Shipping Council testifying before Congress, giving the party line of the World Shipping Council. We need the CEOs, the chief operating officers of these major shipping lines to come and talk about what are they doing to improve the situation. Because again, they're making record profits and there's very little incentive for them to go back to the way things were when they were barely making profits. And this is at the expense of the American consumer, the American shipper. Uh, it's great to have Walmart, Ikea, and all the major firms on the White House Supply Force Task, task Force that's helping with that. But Amazon, Target, Ikea, Home Depot can charter vessels and alleviate some of their issues. When the Secretary of Commerce comes out and says 50% of the supply chain issues have been solved, I don't know what she's talking about. I really don't. 
Because when you look at the prospects out there, will things get better in 2022? Yes, I think they will get better. Will they be fixed pre-COVID levels? No, because there's still fundamental issues that were underlying the supply chain before we went into it. And what we need is attention to that. So the prospects for 2022 are going to be really interesting to watch. And I think one of the best things we can do is stay informed. You can watch my channel, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos when they come out. Support me through my Patreon page and also leave a comment, give it a thumbs up. But also there are a variety of news sources out there you can follow. Yeah, there's the mainstream media, which I know is always an issue, but there's some great specific, unique platforms that look at logistics, freight, shipping. Uh, I use G-Captain a lot. G-Captain does the maritime side for me. Freight waves covers road and rail in particularly really well. Trucking, uh, uh, warehousing exceptionally well. Splash 24-7 does the international aspect. Journal of Commerce is great, but it's behind a paywall. Same thing with Lloyd's List. Uh, but you know, there's a whole variety of sources out there that you can use. And I think one of the great things about YouTube is that it allows us to put out there information like this so that you can access it. So again, happy new year, everybody. Happy 2020, 20, 2022. I hope everybody has a safe new years. Sorry about the prospects here for 2021. I was hoping for four uplifting stories, but again, just didn't happen. But maybe next time. So stay tuned. We'll have, again, videos coming out this week, Wednesday and Friday, and maybe one on the weekend. If you didn't have a chance, posted a lot of historical videos, presentations I've done over the past year, posted some of those out there. Take a look at them. If you're really interested, did one on uh, the Merchant Marine Act of 1920 as the nation's first maritime strategy. And then I did another one of the first six months of World War II and the Japanese and German submarine offensive against North America and the U.S. response to that. So until our next video, this is Sal signing off. Be optimistic, everybody.